Stories of Futures Past presents Five Stories Featuring Dark Humour I Like Martian Music by Charles E. Fritch And All the Girls Were Nude by Richard Magruder Compatible by Richard Reen Smith Seven Day Terror by R. A. Lafferty Breath of Beelzebub by Larry Sternig I Like Martian Music by Charles E. Fritch Originally published in Fantastic Universe, September 1957 Narrated by Tom Trussell Longtree sat before his hole in the ground and gazed thoughtfully among the sandy red hills that surrounded him. His skin at that moment was a medium yellow, a shade between pride and happiness at having his brief symphony almost completed, with just a faint tinge of red to denote that uncertain, cautious approach to the last note which had eluded him thus far. He sat there unmoving for a while, and then he picked up his blowstring and fitted the mouthpiece between his thin lips. He blew into it softly, and at the same time gently strummed the three strings stretching the length of the instrument. The note was a firm, clear one which would have made any other musician proud. But Longtree frowned and at the disappointment his body flushed a dark green and began taking on a purple cast of anger. Hastily he put down the blowstring and tried to think of something else. Slowly his normal colour returned. Across the nearest hill came his friend Channel Jumper, striding on the long, thin, ungaily legs that had given him his name. His skin radiated a blissful orange, Long tree, Channel Jumper exclaimed enthusiastically, collapsing on the ground nearby and folding his legs around him. How's the symphony coming? Not so good, Long tree admitted sadly, and his skin turned green at the memory. If I don't get that last note, I may be this colour the rest of my life. Why don't you play what you've written so far? It's not very long, and it might cheer you up a bit. You're a good friend, Channel Jumper, Longtree thought, and when Rensan and I are married after the music festival, we'll have you over to our hole for dinner. As he thought this, he felt his body take on an orange cast, and he felt better. I can't seem to get that last note, he said, picking up the blowstream again and putting it into position. The final note must be conclusive, something complete in itself and yet be able to sum up the entire meaning of the symphony preceding it. Channel Jumper hummed sympathetically. That's a big job for one note. It might be a sound no one has ever heard before. Longtree shrugged. It may even sound alien, he admitted, but it's got to be the right note. Play, and we'll see, Channel Jumper urged. Longtree played and as he played his features relaxed into a gentle smile of happiness and his body turned orange. Delicately he strummed the three strings of the blowstring with his long-nailed fingers. Softly he pursed his frail lips and blew expertly into the mouthpiece. From the instrument came sounds the like of which Channel Jumper had never before heard. The Martian sat and listened in evident rapture, his body radiating a golden glow of ecstasy. He sat and dreamed, and as the music played, his spine tingled with growing excitement. The music swelled, surrounding him, permeating him, picking him up in a great hand, and sweeping him into new and strange and beautiful worlds, 
worlds of tall metal structures, of vast stretches of greenness, and of water, and of trees, and of small pale creatures that flew giant metal insects. He dreamed of these things which his planet Mars had not known for millions of years. After a while the music stopped, but for a moment neither of them said anything. At last Channel Jumper shied. It's beautiful, he said. Yes, Longtree admitted. But, Channel Jumper seemed puzzled, but somehow it doesn't seem complete, almost but not quite, as though, as though, Longtree sighed. One more note would do it. One more note, no more, no less, at the end of the crescendo would tie the symphony together and end it. But which one? I've tried them all, and none of them fit. His voice had risen higher in his excitement, and Channel Jumper warned, Careful, you're beginning to turn purple. I know, Longtree said mournfully, and the purple tint changed to a more acceptable green. But I've got to win first prize at the festival tomorrow. Red Sand promised to marry me if I did. You can't lose, Channel Jumper told him and then remembered, if you can get that last note. If, Longtree echoed despairingly, as though his friend had asked the impossible. I wish I had your confidence, Chan. You're orange most of the time, while I'm a spectrum. I haven't your artistic temperament, Channel Jumper told him. Besides, orange is such a homely colour, I feel ashamed to have it all the time. As he said this, he turned green with shame, and Longtree laughed at the paradox. Channel Jumper laughed too, glad that he had diverted his friend's attention from the elusive and perhaps non-existent note. "'Did you know the space rocket is due pretty soon?' he said. "'Perhaps even in time for the music festival.' "'Space rocket? Oh, I forgot you were busy composing and didn't get to hear about it,' Channel Jumper said. "'Well, Big Wind, who has a telescope in his hole, told me a rocket is coming through space towards us, possibly from the third planet. Oh, Longtree said, not particularly interested. I wonder if they'll look like us, Channel Jumper wondered. If they're intelligent, of course they will, Longtree said, certainly not caring. Their culture will probably be alien, though, and their music. He paused and turned a very deep yellow. Of course, they might even be able to furnish the note I need to complete my symphony. Channel Jumper shook his head. You've got to compose it all yourself, he reminded, or you don't qualify. And if you don't qualify, you can't win. And if you don't win, you can't marry Red Sand. But just one little note, Longtree said. Channel Jumper shrugged helplessly and turned sympathetically green. I don't make the rules, he said. No, well, Longtree went on in sudden determination. I'll find that last note if I have to stay permanently purple. Channel Jumper shuddered jestingly at this, but remained pleasantly orange. And I'll leave you alone so you can get to work, he said, unfolding himself. Goodbye, Longtree said, but Channel Jumper's long legs had already taken him over to the nearest sand dune and out of sight. Alone, Longtree picked up the blowstring once more, placed it against his stomach, and gave out with a clear, beautiful, experimental note which was again not the one he desired. He still had not found it an hour later, when the sound came. The sound was a low, unpleasant rumble, a sound lower than any Longtree had ever heard, and he wondered what it was. Thinking of it, he remembered he had seen a large flash of fire in the sky a moment before the roar came. But since this last was clearly not likely at all, he dismissed the whole thing as imagination, and tried again to coax some new note from the blowstring. A half hour later, Channel Jumper came bounding excitedly over a sand dune. They're here! he cried, screeching to a halt and emitting yellow flashes of colour. "'Who's here?' Longtree demanded, 
turning violet in annoyance at the interruption. "'The visitors from space,' Channel Jumper explained. "'They landed near my hole. The little creatures, only half as big as we are, but thicker and grey coloured. grey coloured Longtree repeated incredulously, trying to picture the improbability. "'But only on the outside,' Channel Jumper went on. "'They have an outside shell that comes off, and inside they're sort of pink-orange.' Aha, Longtree said, as though he'd suspected it all the time. Evidently, they wear grey suits of some kind, probably for protection. They took them off anyway, Channel Jumper said, eager to impart his knowledge, and they were sort of pink orange underneath. There are only two of them, and one has long hair. Strange, Longtree mused, thinking of their own hairless bodies. Wonder what they want. Channel Jumper shrugged to indicate he didn't know. "'The short-haired one followed me,' he said. Longtree felt the chill blue of fear creep along his spine, but immediate anger at himself changed it conveniently to purple, and it was certain Channel Jumper hadn't noticed. When he had controlled himself, he said, "'Well, it doesn't matter. I've got to get on with our symphony. That last note.' "'He's here,' Channel Jumper announced. "'What?' Channel Jumper pointed eagerly, and Longtree's eyes followed the direction to where the alien stood at the top of a nearby dune, staring at them. Longtree could feel his skin automatically turning red with caution, blending with the sand while the ever-trusting Channel Jumper remained bright orange. "'Good gosh!' the alien exclaimed. "'Not only do they look like modified grasshoppers, they change colour too.' "'What did he say?' Longtree demanded. "'How should I know?' Channel Jumper said. "'It's in another language.' "'And its voice!' Longtree exclaimed, almost disbelieving it. "'Low! Lower than even our drums rumble!' "'And they talk in squeaks yet!' the alien told himself aloud. Longtree regarded the alien carefully. As Channel Jumper had said, the creature was short— and had close-cropped hair on its head. The legs were brief and pudgy, and Longtree felt a shade of pity for the creature who could obviously not get around as well as they. It was undoubtedly intelligent, the space rocket testified to that, and the fact that the creature's skin colour stayed a peaceful pink-orange helped assure Longtree the alien's mission was friendly. The alien raised a short arm and stepped slowly forward. "'I come in peace,' he said in the language they could not understand. "'My wife and I are probably the only humans left alive. When we left Earth, most of the population had been wiped out by atomics. I think we were the only ones to get away.' Longtree felt his redness subside to orange, and he wondered idly what the alien had said. Except for a natural curiosity, he didn't really care, for he remembered suddenly the symphony he had to finish by tomorrow if he were to marry Red Sand. But there was the element of politeness to consider, so he nudged Channel Jumper. Don't just stand there, say something. Channel Jumper flustered and turned several colours in rapid succession. He stammered, Er, uh, ah, uh, welcome to our planet, O oh visitor from space and motioned the alien to sit down. "'That's not very creative,' Longtree accused. "'What's the difference?' Channel Jumper pointed out, "'when he doesn't understand us anyway.' "'You guys don't really look like grasshoppers,' the man from Earth apologised, coming forward. "'It's just the long legs that fooled me from up there. Boy, am I glad to find somebody intelligent on Mars!' From the air we couldn't see any cities or anything, and we were afraid the planet didn't have any life. I wish we could understand each other, though. Longtree smiled pleasantly, and wished the creature would go away so he could search for the last note in his symphony. He picked up his blowstring so the alien wouldn't sit on it. Play for him, Channel Jumper suggested, seating himself by segments. Just the last part to see how he reacts. Music is in universal, you know. Longtree was going to do just that thing, for despite Channel Jumper's warning that he must compose every single note by himself, 
he felt an alien viewpoint might be helpful. He started playing. Channel Jumper sat dreaming, glowing radiantly. But the alien seemed somewhat perturbed by the music and fidgeted nervously. Could it be, Longtree wondered, that the incredible beauty of his composition might not translate acceptably to alien ears? He dismissed the thought as unlikely. Uh, "'That's a bit high, isn't it?' the creature said, shaking his head. Lost in the sweeping melodies, neither Longtree nor Channel Jumper paid any attention to the meaningless syllables. Longtree played on, oblivious to all else, soaring toward the great screaming crescendo that would culminate with a missing note. Vaguely he became aware that the creature had gotten up, and he turned a small part of his attention to the action. Longtree smiled inwardly, pleased, and turned yellow with pride to think even a man from another planet should so appreciate his symphony that he got up and danced a strange dance and even sang to the music. The alien held on to his ears and leaped erratically, singing, No, no, stop it, it's too high, my head's bursting! Channel Jumper, too, seemed pleased by this show of appreciation, though neither of them understood the words, and Longtree swept into the final notes of the rising crescendo with a gusto he had not previously displayed. He stopped where he had always stopped, and the final note came. It startled the Martians. Then the realization swept over them in glad tides of color. The symphony was complete now, with that final alien sound. Longtree could win both the festival prize and Red Sand with it. The last note was a soft popping sound that had come from the creature from another planet. They looked to see him sagging to the ground, his head soft and pulpy. "'My symphony's complete!' Longtree exclaimed jubilantly, a brilliant yellow now. But Channel Jumper's yellow happiness was tinged with green. "'A pity,' he said. "'The creature had to give its life in exchange for the note.' "'I believe it really wanted to,' Longtree said, turning solemn. "'Did you see how it danced to the music, as though in the throes of ecstasy? "'And it didn't change colour once. "'It must have died happy to know it gave itself to a good cause.' "'You could probably get by with claiming to use the creature as an auxiliary instrument,' mused Channel Jumper, practical once more, "'and eliminate any claim that he might have assisted you. "'But what about the festival? "'This one looks as though he doesn't have another note in him.' "'There's the other one,' Longtree reminded, "'the one with long hair. "'We can save that one until tomorrow. "'Of course,' Channel Jumper agreed, standing up. "'I'll go get it, "'and you can keep it safe here in your hole until tomorrow night.' "'You're a good friend, Channel Jumper,' Longtree began, "'but the other was already bounding out of sight over a sand dune.' Blissfully he raised the blowstring into position and played the opening notes to his symphony. The alien lay unmoving with its head in a sticky puddle, but Longtree took no notice. He didn't even consider that after the festival he would never be able to play his symphony again in all its glorious completeness. His spinal column tingled pleasantly and his skin turned the golden yellow of unbearable happiness. The music was beautiful. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. And All the Girls Were Nude by Richard Magruder Originally published in Imagination Stories of Science and Fantasy, December 1954. Narrated by Tom Trussell. Appearances oftentimes can be deceiving, and things most certainly aren't always as they seem. Take the case of Nathaniel Evergood, for instance. The nature of this old man was such that nobody ever called him Nate, not even his closest working companions in the company's bookkeeping department. 
as long as any of them had ever known Nathaniel Evergood, there had never been the slightest indication of any desire of his for intimacy or even friendship. Not once had he shared a drink or lunch or relaxed conversation with anyone, so far as his associates knew. To say Nathaniel was reserved was putting it mildly. It would be more accurate to describe this little old man as dull, completely and absolutely dull. In his appearance, his dress, his speech, in every way imaginable. But, in addition to being quite dull, as everyone knew, Nathaniel Evergood was also a thoroughly evil and obscene old man, as no one knew. Likely, the main reason no one had ever seen the inside of Nathaniel's rooms was the fear within him that his evilness and obscenity might be discovered. For Nathaniel Evergood might be called a connoisseur, to slightly distort the meaning of that word. He could be called a connoisseur of femininity, from afar, and in secret, of course. An arbiter of the well-turned thigh, the rounded, dimpled bottom, the tight waist, and the high, firm bosom. Oh, Nathaniel Evergood was a connoisseur, all right. At the investigation he ventured a very rough but conservative guess that he had collected at least fifty thousand pictures of girls, in whole or in part, horizontal or vertical, semi-nude or nude, over the years. Upon entering his living room, if that were possible, the first thing a casual observer would have noted would be the point of saturation reached by his walls in the photographic content. There were photographs of blondes and brunettes and redheads. There were pictures of thin girls, fat girls, girls with ample bosoms and girls lacking, girls holding telephones, books in ice cream cones, girls sixteen, girls twenty-five, and girls no longer girls. They were shot in glorious colour by the hundreds, originals and prints alike, but there wasn't among them one single view of the Grand Canyon. Not even a solitary Indian astride a tired horse, looking pensively out over the prairie. There was a red-skinned maiden, mind you, but she wasn't sitting a horse, and she certainly wasn't staring laconically out over any prairie either. Rather, she appeared to be testing with her toe the water temperature of a tree-shaded brook somewhere, and she was clad in a lone, strategically located feather. On the tea-table, in the bookshelves, in the magazine rack, and all through his rooms one might find other evidence of this evil and obscene old man's preoccupation with womankind. But the kind of woman he was preoccupied with often wasn't the kind that married dear old dad. He subscribed to every girly publication in the country, and to several in France. So you see, Nathaniel Evergood was not only a connoisseur, he was also an avid collector. There were books, and there were magazines, and there was even a deck of playing cards backed with the most astounding set of pictures you ever saw. That anyone could sit down to a game of Old Maid or Snap with that deck of cards is inconceivable, to say the least. But such an evil and obscene old man as Nathaniel Evergood likely never played games with his cards anyway. He would much prefer to just sit and look at them, the reverse side, of course. He later said he probably spent almost half his really quite meagre earnings for up-to-date additions to his extensive collection, the girly magazines, playing cards, and prints he received from various mail-order houses, sent, as the advertisements testified, in a plain, unmarked envelope. But the other half of his collection, the photographs, mounted, unmounted, matte, and glossy enlargements and contact prints, Nathaniel Evergood came by in an entirely different and somewhat novel manner. These resulted from his ability as a fairly advanced amateur photographer. Over the years, Nathaniel had acquired three fine cameras, an excellent enlarger, two contact printers, electronic flash units, interchangeable lenses, filters, sunshades and lens caps, 
extension tubes and tripods. In short, Nathaniel Evergood was well equipped to take photographs of just about everything. He had the equipment, and he had the necessary technical knowledge and facility, but invariably he passed up the usual pictorial, architectural, human interest, interpretive and abstract photographs, even when the opportunities for truly fine shots were there. Instead, he took roll after roll, pack after pack, and cartridge upon cartridge of girls. Nothing but girls. All sorts of girls. Just girls. At the investigation, Nathaniel suggested that the presence of a camera introduced on the scene in a gentlemanly and courteous manner was enough to cause almost frenzied unlocking and unzipping by even the most demure and prudish female. Ladies, Nathaniel said wisely, love to have their bodies recorded for posterity. Oh, he was certainly a very evil and highly obscene old man, was Nathaniel Evergood, if you ever saw one. But the full import of what his evil old soul and obscene little mind contained would probably escape the casual observer, unless he happened onto a tiny cubbyhole at the back of the rooms occupied by Nathaniel. This was the sanctum sectorum, so to speak, of his thin little heart, for here Nathaniel Evergood guarded jealously a secret utterly beyond belief. He fancied himself to be something of an inventor, and he was, too, of a sort. His ardent and relentless pursuit of photographic subject matter during the years had led him into situations demanding full knowledge of his craft, from a technical rather than from an artistic point of view. Thus, this inventive turn of mind was given an able assist by his understanding of the theory, optics and chemistry of photography. And now, he was just putting the finishing touches to the most important project in his entire life. Basing his plan of action on the simple optical theory of astigmatism, Nathaniel designed a lens. Astigmatism, he had learned, results in the human eye, as well as in manufactured lenses of certain formulae, in the failure of horizontal and vertical target lines to reach a common focus so his lens was designed intentionally astigmatic, allowing focus to be brought on one group of target lines or another, but never on both simultaneously. To the front of the lens mount, he added a front-surfaced prism and a filter, carefully ground and tinted internally the precise colour complement of human flesh. He reasoned, quite accurately as it turned out, that the prism could gather all the colours of light together and converged them at the focal plane of the lens as pure white, thus eliminating all colour. But, at the same instant, the complement filter replaced last the flesh colour of the object focused upon, and subsequently recorded on film. Then, in one fell swoop, the lens allowed Nathaniel to focus carefully on one group of target lines, in this case, the female form underneath its covering automatically throwing an opposing group of lines out of focus, the covering over the female body, in his case. The prism was busily gathering together all colour and converting it into pure white light, while lastly the complementary filter replaced the colour of flesh to the image and finally to the photograph. You see the possibilities, of course. By replacing the normal lens of one fine camera with his invention, Nathaniel Evergood was now equipped to photograph in rich, natural colour the female form, divine, unfettered by any or all clothing. Well, this day in particular, Nathaniel Evergood stationed himself, poised like a pointer, at his window, camera in hand, invention in place, waiting impatiently for the first likely subject to appear. And... Shameful as it must seem, this evil and obscene old man was quite noticeably drooling right from one side of his pinched little mouth. He heard the saucy click of her heels on the pavement a full thirty seconds before she swung gracefully into his myopic line of sight. 
She was blondish. Not too blonde, understand, but just blonde enough. And she was a true blue blonde at heart, if you know what I mean. Shutter, set at one two hundredth of a second. Diaphragm, 5.6. Film, real life colour. Rangefinder, superimposed. Click, 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 click. Four shots. Four beautiful pictures, in colour too, before she was gone on down the street. With incredible speed, this evil and obscene old man descended from his window perch and scuttered back to his little cubbyhole. He darkened the room and unloaded the automatic sheet film holder. No attempt can be made to describe the gnawing impatience that Nathaniel Evergood felt as he sloshed the sensitised emulsions through the series of solutions for the precise time required for true colour rendition, as, after ninety long minutes, he washed the sheets and finally held them up to the light for the first wide-eyed look. She was there all right, his swaying blonde. She was there, all of her. Well, sir, after filling his eyes and his evil little mind with the four lovely images of the girl, Nathaniel Evergood rushed to the downtown camera shop and wrote out a large cheque for their entire supply of real-life colour film. Then, back on the street, madly clicking, 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 every pretty girl that came along, every single one. Oh, he had a time for himself, did this evil, obscene old man. The next day was Sunday, happily for his designing brain, and there was no work. After a full night in his cubbyhole developing sheet after sheet of colour film, Nathaniel went to the beach and, as you must know by now, set his camera shutter clicking like a miniature machine gun. And again, the results were most spectacular, to put it mildly. The collection grew and grew and grew and Nathaniel Evergood was never wearier or never happier. What an evil, obscene man he was. Now, if Nathaniel had stuck to his camera and to his wonderful invention, this story might never have been written. But evil and obscene as he was, he soon began to dream of new worlds to conquer. Simple as it had been to apply the principle of astigmatism to photography, and with such marvellous results, why not apply the same principle to his eyeglasses? This would eliminate the annoying delay of taking pictures, then developing and viewing them, to say nothing of the terrific expense involved. Usually, when writers say, no sooner said than done, it is often a gross exaggeration. But Nathaniel was quick about it, nevertheless. In short order, the problems of focus, image distortion and aberrations were ironed out, and Nathaniel ventured once again out into the street to give his newest brainchild its dry run, so to speak. The glasses worked all right. They worked just fine. And Nathaniel Evergood, in a leering ecstasy, raced up and down the streets, peering with his watery and overworked eyes this way and that, up and down, all around and back again. For the next day or so, Nathaniel was busy as a bee attending every beauty contest and fashion show in town, and even found time for a quick run out to the girls' school. The third day, following the initial test of his new seeing eye glasses, Nathaniel suddenly observed there were an uncommon lot of nicely constructed young ladies right in his own department at the office. An opportunist, if ever there was one, Nathaniel thought it might be fun to give the remarkable spectacles a chance to separate the women from the girls and the girls from the children. This he did, and although his work suffered, he spent the better part of the day classifying the office help in various categories and learning there were at least two ladies who fell in no classification whatsoever. It was the nicest day he had spent at the office in quite some time, he decided. Not long after that, the strain brought on by the frequent changes from his normal reading glasses to the prism spectacles became so intense that he decided there was really no good reason why he shouldn't just wear them, the new ones, of course, all the time. The better to preserve his vision, and the better to pursue his avocation. So he did. And therein lay the downfall of Nathaniel Evergood. 
For, you see, the climax of our story comes a month later, on a sunny July day, when Nathaniel made his decision to take a short stroll among the midday lady shoppers downtown. Understand, with those glasses of his, Nathaniel had become so accustomed to seeing his fellow creatures au naturel, as it were, that it was on the verge of becoming almost commonplace. But evil and obscene as he was, it was still highly diverting yet. At any rate, on this particular day, Nathaniel had made his way no more than a couple of hundred feet from his front door, when a heavy hand was clamped on his shoulder and a rough voice growled, "'Where do you think you're going, you scrawny old buzzard? You ought to know better!' Nathaniel Evergood spun about, suddenly petrified. The uniform, of course, was invisible, and the man was no raving beauty, he'd have said, but there was no mistaking the ugly gun and the shiny badge and the authoritative tone of voice. "'I beg your pardon,' Nathaniel spluttered indignantly. "'Just what is the meaning of this ridiculous outrage?' The beefy Irish cop was even more indignant, though. "'Now just look at yourself. I've seen absent-minded old-timers parading down the streets with no shoes on, or even no pants on. But just look at yourself. Not a stitch on!' Nathaniel Evergood looked down at himself in sudden horrified realisation, and looked back up as quickly. But, but, he began, everybody else. But then, of course, he had to stop. Well, the upshot of it was that the officer hauled him back into his rooms to get some clothes on before casting him down to the station house. As it was before they entered the apartment, Nathaniel stood to get ten days probation or a token fine for forgetting all his clothes, Irish cops being ordinarily an understanding lot. But, when confronted by the staggering array of unclad femininity, this Irishman flushed a deep red, spewed an amazed Irish blasphemy, and then roared like a lion. And don't think the officer didn't check the evidence carefully, with a proper degree of loathing, of course, before shoving Nathaniel unceremoniously down the street to call the paddy wagon. Of a certainty, things went much worse for the evil, obscene Nathaniel Evergood than they might have, had not this righteously outraged policeman done his duty as he saw it. Matter of fact, they threw the book at the old boy, but not until a thorough investigation was made, and not until several hundred outraged members of every morals, anti-delinquency and anti-vice committee in town had carefully checked and gasped over all the collected evidence. Never in the history of the city had there been such a hue and a cry aroused for the punishment of an offender. So Nathaniel Evergood, evil and obscene as ever, got five years for possession of pornography, indecent exposure and other charges. In the words of the presiding jurist at the climax of the spectacular trial, such a sentence is far too lenient a punishment for a crime of such enormity. And, to this very day, there rests in the files of the local constabulary the voluminous collection of Nathaniel Evergood, occupying fourteen huge, well-worn cabinets, and always on display for the indignant and affronted eyes of any anti-sin committeeman who wishes to examine it. Also taken as evidence was Nathaniel's wonderful prismatic lens and his marvellous glasses. Any time you're by the station house, drop into the chief's office, and there, in the open cabinet opposite his desk, you can see the venal objects. Now, though, the lenses are pretty scratched and worn, but they're still the same two inventions of that ingenious but evil and obscene old man, Nathaniel Evergood, number 5049.870. And not that it makes much difference since the case is long past in close, but it might be interesting to point out that the chief is often seen at beauty contents and fashion shows wearing thick lensed glasses, which, he explains, the optometrist prescribed for his failing sight, and I don't know if it's true or not, but they say the chief is also the biggest customer the local camera shops have for a certain product called real life colour film. Not that it makes much difference now. 
Nathaniel Levergood is serving his sentence out, evil and obscene as ever, and the case is long past and closed. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Compatible by Richard Reen Smith Writing as Richard R. Smith Originally published in Fantastic Universe, August 1958 Narrated by Tom Trissel There are many ways, murder included, in which husbands can settle certain problems. This was even more drastic. George stood by the fireplace, his feature twisted into a grimace. It's hell, I tell you, a living hell. I sipped my drink and tried to think of a subtle way to change the subject. I didn't like to hear a person's personal problems, and every time I visited George he invariably complained about Helen. If it had been anyone else, I might have thought it wasn't entirely Helen's fault. But George and I have, have been roommates in college, and I knew him like a brother. He was a person who got along with almost everyone, intelligent, easygoing, and likable. He lifted his glass and glared at me, as if I were the guilty party. She's a worrywart, he continued, a hypochondriac, a neurotic, an escapist, and a communist. He studied the ceiling thoughtfully, and sometimes I think she's a little crazy. I tried to calm him. Don't worry about it. If things get worse, get a divorce. Divorce? Ha! She wouldn't give me a divorce if... The door opened. Helen smiled half-heartedly, her pale face quickly resuming its unhappy expression, as if it tired her facial muscles when she smiled. Hello, Ed. Nice to see you again. Hello, Helen. I glanced at George and noticed he had closed his eyes as if the sight of his wife was unbearable. His lower lip was white where he gripped it with his teeth, and I silently hoped he wouldn't draw blood. Helen sank into a chair and raised her skirt to reveal her right leg. "'Did George tell you about my legs?' she inquired. She stroked the leg affectionately. "'Arthritis. George grafted a new one on for me. Feels ten times better.' My face blanched. The idea of replacing body parts from bags didn't nauseate me. If a man is in an automobile accident and loses an arm, and that arm can be replaced, I think that's marvellous. What sickened me were the people who actually enjoyed having a part of their body replaced with a part from a criminal or corpse. No, I sat down. My knees were weak. I felt short of breath. George didn't tell me. I... She interrupted with details of the operation. The details and list of her other ailments lasted half an hour, during which George drank steadily, and I waited for a lull so I could glance at my watch and say something about being late for an appointment. I saw George several times during the next few weeks, never at his house. I didn't visit him on my own initiative, because Helen, as I had seen during my last visit, had passed from the stage of being unpleasant and reached the stage of being unbearable. I didn't want to be around her or listen to her, and George must have realised my feelings because he didn't invite me to his house for some time. But both of us had a habit of stopping at the club on the outskirts of town, and we met there often. Each time we met, George complained. Each time he seemed to drink more and complain more. I worried about his job. He was a surgeon, one of the best, and a surgeon needs good nerves and steady hands when he performs delicate operations. I urged him to get a divorce, but he said he didn't want one. I love Helen, he said one time. Well, I don't exactly love Helen, but I love her body. It's like the old saying about marrying a girl because she's pretty is like picking a rose by looking at the stem. We're all different, you know, and we all have different tastes. When I first saw Helen, well, she's just right for me. To me, she looks as good as Marilyn Monroe looks to the average man. I like having her around. I'll be lost without her. 
but at the same time, she's changed so damn much, she makes me sick. And there it was. He still wanted Helen, but she had changed into a personality that he hated. Over a period of years, she had changed into a morbid hypochondriac, an unpleasant woman who enjoyed, more than anything else, such things as having one of her legs replaced and sampling the latest pills and drugs. George said he had tried to get her to see a psychiatrist, but she refused. And you can't have a person committed to a mental institution because they have an unpleasant personality. It seemed as if there were no solution to his problem. Then, late one evening, I received a phone call from George. Come over and have a few drinks, he said. We'll have a party. Helen's changed. You should see her. I was interested in his problem, so I went. Helen greeted me at the door, and I had the surprise of my life. At one time she had been beautiful, but she had faded during the past few years. By staying indoors she had grown pale, listless. As her personality changed, it had also changed her features, and her eyes had developed a sleepy, lifeless look, and deep lines had formed on her face. But the Helen who greeted me that night was not like that. Her face had a healthy flush, her eyes sparkled, and she seemed vibrant, bubbling, just like the Helen I had known so long ago. George and I had a good time that night. He laughed and joked for the first time in months. We drank, talked, played chess, and then drank and talked some more. Every now and then Helen would float by, a gorgeous creature, laughing at George's jokes, mixing our drinks, and smiling at George as if he were the most wonderful man in the world. When I couldn't bear it any longer, I whispered, What happened? George drained his glass and shouted across the room, Come here, Helen. She came. George said, Promise not to tell anyone. It's very important. I couldn't imagine his reason for asking me that, but I said, I promise. Well, George explained, I can't take all the credit. I'm a fairly good surgeon, but Lucas had the hardest job. We did it together. Do you know Lucas? He's an electrical engineer. A genius. He designed that electronic calculator at... Show him, Helen interrupted. Show him! She was giggling, laughing, almost jumping up and down with joy. I thought, she's her old self again, cheerful, bubbling over. George said, I finally realised what she needed more than anything else. He raised Helen's soft brown hair and opened a small panel in the back of her head. In the recess was a maze of tubes and electrical wiring. She needed a new head, George said. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Seven Day Terror by R. A. Lafferty, originally published in Worlds of If Science Fiction, March 1962. Narrated by Tom Trizel. Is there anything you want to make disappear? Clarence Willoughby asked his mother. A sink full of dishes is all I can think of. How will you do it? I just built a disappearer. All you do is cut the other end out of a beer can. Then you take two pieces of red cardboard with peepholes in the middle and fit them in the ends. You look through the peepholes and blink. Whatever you look at will disappear. Oh, but I don't know if I can make them come back. We'd better try it on something else. Dishes cost money. As always, Myra Willoughby had to admire the wisdom of her nine-year-old son. She would not have had such foresight herself. He always did. You can try it on Blanche Manor's cat outside there. Nobody will care if it disappears except Blanche Manor's. All right. He put the disappearer to his eye and blinked. The cat disappeared from the sidewalk outside. His mother was interested. I wonder how it works. Do you know how it works? Yes. You take a beer can with both ends cut out and put in two pieces of cardboard. Then you blink. Never mind, take it outside and play with it. You hadn't better make anything disappear in here till I think about this. 
but when he had gone his mother was utterly disturbed. I wonder if I have a precocious child. Why, there's lots of grown people who wouldn't know how to make a disappearer that would work. I wonder if Blanche Manners would miss her cat very much. Clarence went down to the plugged nickel, a pothouse on the corner. Do you have anything you want to make disappear, Nokomis? Only my paunch. If I make it disappear, it'll leave a hole in you, and you'll bleed to death. That's right, I would. Why don't you try it on the fire plug outside? This, in a way, was one of the happiest afternoons ever in the neighbourhood. The children came from blocks around to play in the flooded streets and gutters, and if some of them drowned, and we don't say that they did drown, in the flood, and, brother, it was a flood, why, you'd have to expect things like that. The fire engines. Whoever heard of calling fire engines to put out a flood were apparatus deep in the water. The policemen and ambulance men wandered around wet and bewildered. Resuscitator, resuscitator, anybody want a resuscitator? chanted Clarissa Willoughby. Oh, shut up, said the ambulance attendants. Nokomis, the barman in the plugged nickel, called Clarence aside. I don't believe, just for the moment, I'll tell anyone what happened to that fire plug, he said. I won't tell if you won't tell, said Clarence. Officer Comstock was suspicious. There's only seven possible explanations. One of the seven Willoughby kids did it. I don't know how. It'd take a bulldozer to do it, and then there'd be something left of the plug. But however they did it, one of them did it. Officer Comstock had a talent for getting nearer to the truth of dark matters. This is why he was walking a beat out here in the boondocks instead of sitting in a chair downtown. Clarissa, said Officer Comstock in a voice like thunder. Resuscitator, resuscitator, anybody want a resuscitator? chanted Clarissa. Do you know what happened to that fire plug? asked Officer C. I have an uncanny suspicion. As yet there is no more than that. When I am better informed, I will advise you. Clarissa was eight years old, and much given to uncanny suspicions. Clementine, Harold, Corinne, Jimmy, Cyril, he asked the five younger Willoughby children, do you know what happened to the fire plug? There was a man around yesterday. I bet he took it, said Clementine. "'I don't even remember a fire-plug there. "'I think you're making a lot of fuss about nothing,' said Harold. "'City Hall's going to hear about this,' said Corinne. "'Pretty dumb sure,' said Jimmy, "'but I won't tell.' "'Cyril!' cried Officer Comstock in a terrible voice. "'Not a terrifying voice, a terrible voice.' "'He felt terrible now. "'Great green bananas,' said Cyril. "'I'm only three years old. "'I don't see how it's even my responsibility.' "'Clarence,' said Officer Comstock. Clarence gulped. "'Do you know where that fire-plug went?' Clarence brightened. "'No, sir, I don't know where it went.' A bunch of smart Alex from the water department came out and shut off the water for a few blocks around and put some kind of cap on in place of the fire-plug. "'This sure is going to be a funny-sounding report,' said one of them. Officer Comstock walked away discouraged. "'Don't bother me, Miss Manners,' he said. "'I don't know where to look for your cat. "'I don't even know where to look for a fire-plug.' "'I have an idea,' said Clarissa, "'that when you find the cat, "'you will find the fire-plug at the same place. "'As yet, it is only an idea.' Ozzy Murphy wore a little hat on the top of his head. Clarence pointed his weapon and winked. The hat was no longer there, "'but a little trickle of blood was running down the pate.' "'I don't believe I'd play with that any more,' said Nokomis. "'Who's playing?' said Clarence. "'This is for real.' This was the beginning of the seven-day terror in the heretofore obscure neighbourhood. Trees disappeared from the parkings. Lamp posts were as though they had never been. Wally Waldorf drove home, got out, slammed the door of his car, and there was no car. 
As George Mullendorf came up the walk to his house, his dog Pete ran to meet him and took a flying leap to his arms. The dog left the sidewalk, but something happened. The dog was gone, and only a bark lingered for a moment in the puzzled air. But the worst were the fire plugs. The second plug was installed the morning after the disappearance of the first. In eight minutes it was gone, and the floodwaters returned. Another one was in by twelve o'clock. Within three minutes it had vanished. The next morning fire plug number four was installed. The water commissioner was there. The city engineer was there. The chief of police was there with a riot squad. The president of the Parent Teachers Association was there. The president of the university was there. The mayor was there. Three gentlemen of the FBI, a newsreel photographer, eminent scientists, and a crowd of honest citizens. Let's see it disappear now, said the city engineer. Let's see it disappear now, said the police chief. Let's see it dis- It did, didn't it? said one of the eminent scientists. And it was gone, and everyone was very wet. At least I have the picture sequence of the year, said the photographer but his camera and apparatus disappeared from the midst of them. "'Shut off the water and cap it,' said the commissioner, "'and don't put it in another plug yet. "'That was the last plug in the warehouse.' "'This is too big for me,' said the mayor. "'I wonder that Tass doesn't have it yet.' "'Tass has it,' said the little round man. "'I am Tass.' "'If all of you gentlemen will come into the plugged nickel,' said Nokomis, and try one of our new fire hydrant highballs, you will all be happier. These are made of good corn whiskey, brown sugar, and hydrant water from this very gutter. You can be the first to drink them. Business was phenomenal at the plugged nickel, for it was in front of its very doors that the fire plugs disappeared in floods of gushing water. I know a way we can get rich, said Clarissa several days later to her father, Tom Willoughby. Everybody says they're going to sell their houses for nothing and move out of the neighbourhood. Go get a lot of money and buy them all. Then you can sell them again and get rich. I wouldn't buy them for a dollar each. Three of them have disappeared already, and all the families but us have the furniture moved out in their front yards. There might be nothing but vacant lots in the morning. Good, then buy the vacant lots, and you can be ready when the houses come back. Come back? Are the houses going to come back? Do you know anything about this young lady? I have a suspicion verging on a certainty. As of now, I can say no more. Three eminent scientists were gathered in an untidy suite that looked as though it belonged to a drunken sultan. This transcends the metaphysical. It impinges on the quantum continuum. In some way it obsoletes boff, said Dr. Velikov Vonk. "'The contingence on this intransigence is the most mystifying aspect,' said Arpad Arkabaranan. "'Yes,' said Willie McGilly. "'Who would have thought that you could do it with a beer can and two pieces of cardboard? "'When I was a boy I used an oatmeal box in red Crayola.' "'I do not always follow you,' said Dr. Vonk. "'I wish you would speak plainer.' "'So far no human had been injured or disappeared.' except for a little blood on the pate of Ozzie Murphy, on the lobes of Conchita when her gaudy earrings disappeared from her very ears, a clipped finger or so when a house vanished as the front door knob was touched, a lost toe when a neighbourhood boy kicked at a can, and the can was not, probably not more than a pint of blood and three or four ounces of flesh altogether. Now, however, Mr. Buckle, the grocery man, disappeared before witnesses, this was serious. Some mean-looking investigators from downtown came out to the Willoughby's. The meanest-looking one was the mayor. In happier days he had not been a mean man, but the terror had now reigned for seven days. There have been ugly rumours, said one of the mean investigators, that link certain events to this household. Do any of you know anything about them? I started most of them, said Clarissa, but I didn't consider them ugly. Cryptic, rather. But if you want to get to the bottom of this, just ask me a question. Did you make those things disappear? 
asked the investigator. "'That isn't the question,' said Clarissa. "'Do you know where they have gone?' asked the investigator. "'That isn't the question either,' said Clarissa. "'Can you make them come back?' "'Why, of course I can. Anybody can. Can't you?' "'I cannot. If you can, please do so at once.' "'I need some stuff. Get me a gold watch and a hammer. Then go down to the drug store and get me this list of chemicals, and I need a yard of black velvet and a pound of rock candy.' "'Shall we?' asked one of the investigators. "'Yes,' said the mayor. "'It's our only hope. Get her anything she wants.' And it was all assembled. "'Why does she get all the attention?' asked Clarence. "'I was the one that made all the things disappear. How does she know how to get them back?' "'I knew it!' cried Clarissa with hate. "'I knew he was the one that did it. He read in my diary how to make a disappearer. If I was his mother, I'd whip him for reading his little sister's diary. That's what happens when things like that fall into irresponsible hands.' She poised the hammer over the gold watch of the mayor on the floor. "'I have to wait a few seconds. This can't be hurried. It'll be only a little while.' The second hand swept around to the point where it was preordained for it before the world began. Clarissa suddenly brought down the hammer with all her force on the beautiful gold watch. "'That's all,' she said. "'Your troubles are over. See, there is Blanche Manners's cat on the sidewalk just where she was seven days ago.' And the cat was back. "'Now let's go down to the plugged nickel and watch the fire plug come back.' They had only a few minutes to wait. It came from nowhere and clanged into the street like a sign— and a witness. "'Now I predict,' said Clarissa, "'that every single object will return exactly seven days from the time of its disappearance.' The seven-day terror had ended. The objects began to reappear. "'How?' asked the mayor. "'Did you know they would come back in seven days?' "'Because it was a seven-day disappearer that Clarence made. I also know how to make a nine-day, a thirteen-day, a twenty-seven-day, and an eleven-year disappearer. I was going to make a thirteen-day one, but for that you have to colour the ends with the blood from a little boy's heart, and Cyril cried every time I tried to make a good cut. You really know how to make all of these? Yes, but I shudder if the knowledge should ever come into unauthorised hands. I shudder too, Clarissa. But tell me, why did you want the chemicals? For my chemistry set. And the black velvet? For doll dresses. And the pound of rock candy? How did you ever get to be mayor of this town if you have to ask questions like that? What do you think I wanted the rock candy for? One last question, said the mayor. Why did you smash my gold watch with a hammer? Oh, said Clarissa, that was for dramatic effect. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. And now, for the next story. Breath of Beelzebub by Larry Sternig Originally published in Planet Stories, Winter 1946 Narrated by Tom Trussell all that had been distilled from the curious vegetation of the doomed planetoids was half an ounce, a mere thimbleful of blue liquor, but it was enough to drive a universe mad. The Martian servant stopped at my desk, coughed faintly to attract my attention. I looked up, and he handed me a calling card on which was printed, Slain O'Gramey. It was a limp, thumb-marked and discouraged-looking emissary. "'He wishes to see Mr. Ames,' the wedge-faced servant told me. The high disdain in his tone of voice revealed more clearly than words his opinion of the visitor. I shrugged and dropped the card on my desk. "'Oh, well, send him in. I'll give him the brush off.' The Martian faded away, and I turned back to the 1999 capitulation figures Mr. Ames wanted. I forgot about Slane or Gramey, whoever he was, until a timid, Hello, made me look up from the reports. 
you are Mr. Fleming Ames?' he asked diffidently. He was an odd-looking little guy with a head like an oversized cue ball and a narrow fringe of fuzzy greying hair that looked like a misguided halo. He wore green-tinted contact lenses that made his eyes seem unusually large and bright. "'No, I'm not Fleming Ames,' I told him. "'I'm Bill Deneen, Mr. Ames' confidential secretary. What can I do for you?' Um, "'Mr. Ames is president of Universal Liquors Incorporated, isn't he?' I nodded. "'I have something I'd like to show him, Mr. Deneen. It's something new. I found it on Planetoid Y145.' I stared at him almost incredulously. He didn't look like a spaceman. "'You mean a kind of drink? But I didn't think any of the planetoids were inhabited. How did you?' It isn't a drink exactly, Mr. Deneen, and Planetoid Y-145 isn't inhabited. In fact, there isn't any Planetoid Y-145 anymore. A meteor hit it last week, I read in the astrogation reports. Busted it to smithereens. He reached in his pocket and held up a little transpariplast vial, which held about half an ounce of a murky blue fluid. So this is all there is anywhere, as far as I know he revealed, is the juice of a kind of lichen that grew on the planetoid. I stopped there last month looking for minerals, and I took some of the lichen along just to see what it was. I didn't know then. I distilled this on the way back and threw out the lichen, so this is all. There is, I finished for him, a bit impatiently. But what is it? And if there isn't any more, what good can it do us? Your laboratories can synthesize things, can't they? Yes, I know it's an expensive process, but this stuff is very concentrated and a little goes a long way, so even if it did cost quite a bit to make, just think of the... But get to the point, Mr. O'Gramey. What is it? Um, I named it Breath of Beelzebub. You put a drop of it in water and... Oh boy, you don't even drink the water. The gas works through your skin. Osmosis or something. I found it out accidentally. I frowned at him. What do you mean, oh boy? If you read anything about our policies, you know that we discourage the use of strong intoxicants. Ever since the Margin uprising ten years ago, we've been promoting beers, ales and Venusian chlora, and weaning drinks away from anything stronger. What effect does this have? O'Gramey took the stopper out of the vial and set it carefully upright on my desk. It works without water too, he said, but it's less efficient this way. One drop in water is more potent than a whole vile plain. Feel it? I did, before he even finished speaking. My hands were resting on the desk, and it began there, and worked its way up my arms, a warm, throbbing glow of sensation that was unlike anything I'd ever felt before. Must have gone right through clothing, for it reached my shoulders and started up my neck and down my body from there. It was a mildly pleasant tingling, until it reached my head. Then suddenly I realised I was more than pleasant. It was, well, it wa just wasn't like anything I'd ever felt before. A feeling of utter happiness is the nearest that I can come to describing it, although it was only partly that. I knew that I hadn't a care in the system worth worrying about. I knew that it didn't matter the least bit whether or not I got those figures coordinated for Mr. Ames. If he fired me for not doing them, so what? Wasn't I going to marry his daughter, Margie Amelita Ames? You can bet your last rocket charge I was, and if he or that fat, snooty, dictatorial wife of his objected, I'd just tell them to... O'Gramey, with a bulging green eyes, picked up the vial and carefully replaced the stopper. He was smiling. He started to say, Well, what do you... I stood up, and leaned forward across the decks. Slay no bosom pal of mine, I said. You've got something there. Listen, why let a stuffed shirt like Fleming Ames in on it? I'll handle it for you. I'll make us millions. Slay no Gramey looked at me and frowned a little. Um, he said sceptically, I'm sure you mean well, Mr. Deneen, but hadn't you better wait until you get over feeling... Feeling what? I demanded. I assure you, Palsy, that I'm not in the slightest upset... "'Have you a laboratory like Mr. Ames? Can you synthesize?' I waved a hand airily, 
Laboratory? Don't need one for something simple as that. I studied chemistry in high school, and I assure you, pal, that I can quite easily... O'Gramey shook his head slowly. I've tried this stuff often, Mr. Deneen, and I'm used to it. But I see that you... Perhaps I'd better come back tomorrow evening instead of... And lose a whole day? I scoffed. Why, we'll be rich by then. Come on, Palsy, let's go back and join Fleming Ames's dinner party. I want you to meet Margie Ames. The old folks don't know it yet, but Margie and I are engaged. Besides, I added with a sly grin, winking at him, there is a tank full of mermaids back there that'll knock your eyes out. It cost a fortune to have them brought in from Mercury. I took O'Gramey by the arm and propelled him out into the long corridor. The Polaroid glass walls of the huge building looked down upon the great city of Mars with its network of shuttle car tubes, the copter landings, and we passed a section of wall that opened into the sky parkway, and a draught of cold, fresh air hit me. I stopped suddenly. Phew, I said, closing my eyes and then opening them again slowly. Say, I've been talking like a... Will you please forget everything I said? The little guy grinned. I discounted it. I've been there myself. The first time I tried it, on my way back to Mars, I put three drops in water, and I radioed on ahead to tell them I was buying the whole fleet of interplanetary, and to get me an option on. Listen, I cut in soberly. I will take you back to Mr. Ames, though, dinner party or not, unless he objects because it's too potent. I'm sure he'll be interested if we demonstrate. What's a safe dose? Nothing like the one I just had. One drop, if it's a large room, mild acceleration and release from care. You had about the equivalent of two drops in water. Delusions of grandeur, if you pardon my... Sure, I grinned. We'd been walking and were almost back to the big drawing room where Fleming Ames would be entertaining his dinner guests. What happens if you use, not that I'm suggesting it, four or five drops? Partial dissociation of personality, and with six or seven drops, you might find yourself in the body of whoever happens to be in the room with... His voice trailed off absently, and his green-tinted eyes actually popped as we stepped through the doorway. He gulped. You... You really meant that about... The mermaids? I laughed as he fumbled in his pocket and brought out the vial to make sure the stopper wasn't tight. Sure, you needn't have discounted that, my friend. I led him to the glowing plexiglass tank in the centre of the room. It was a drum-like affair, about five feet high and eight in diameter, complete with bright green seaweed and a glittering red cave-like shelter of mercurian coral. But that wasn't what we were looking at nor the dozens of goldfish that swam merrily about the coral and bumped their snouts against the plexiglass sides of the tank. It was the ten tiny mermaids that crowded around the coral base, wiggling gracefully towards us one by one to stare at us staring at them. They were much like the fabled marine creatures I've read about on earth, only smaller, like little dolls, and far more beautiful than those imaginative ancients ever dreamed of. From the waist up, they were pocket editions of perfectly formed girls. Their eyes were amber, with the sparkle of a coquette. Their hair luxuriantly long and golden. Silver nails tipped each tiny finger, and the silver was repeated in the gleaming scales which covered the tapering lower half of the graceful bodies. O'Gramey peered in delighted fascination at the strange sight. Fantastic, he breathed. Stupendous, I corrected. Aren't they honeys? Just then the dinner party filed in from the adjoining room. I caught Mr. Amy's eye, and he gave me the nod. So I introduced Slane O'Gramey. Besides Mr. Ames and his wife and Margie, there were three guests. Roger Westcott, interplanetary transport magnet, and his wife, and Senator B. Pierpont Weems. Fleming Ames turned the little vial over in his hand and examined it frowningly. You say, Bill, that the effect is a mild and pleasant exhilaration? I smiled. Well, Mr. Ames, it was more than mild, but then I got an overdose, I suppose. There was no physical incoordination, though, just mental stimulus. I had a momentary inclination to... I paused. 
it didn't seem wise to tell my employer just what that momentary inclination had been. Mr. Ames carefully uncorked the vial. Well, he said, I guess if you've tried it and found it safe, we'll give it a group test. Try it as an after-dinner cordial. Any will mind? He glanced about the huge air-cushioned divans and lounging chairs where the guests were comfortably seated. Both Mr. Westcott and Senator Weems nodded approvingly. Mrs. Ames stiffened in her overstuffed chair and said a bit tensely, "'Fleming, I simply will not tolerate.' But Margie put a hand on her mother's arm and said, "'Now, mother, don't be a spoil sport. I'm sure Bill wouldn't let Dad try it if it wasn't all right.' I smiled at Margie gracefully. Then Mr. Ames turned toward the mermaid tank behind him, and Slane O'Gramey said quickly, "'Be careful, Mr. Ames, don't drop!' And then it happened. The opened vial slipped from the liquor magnet's hand as he lifted it over the rim on the tank. It hit the top of the water with a soft plop, sank and struck the coral with a faint clink. Diffusion in the water must have been almost instantaneous. It was light blue throughout, even before the vial hit the bottom. I heard a low exclamation from O'Gramey, and then he yelped excitedly, "'Quick! Everyone! Get out of!' His voice trailed off, and there was a beatific expression came over his face. I was only a bit farther from the tank than he, and it hit me almost at the same time. It was the same sensation I had experienced in my office, not much stronger, but far more sudden and complete. His eyes were still on the mermaid tank, and I thought for an instant that it was empty, that the mermaids and goldfish had mysteriously vanished into nothingness. Then a pair of golden streaks, faintly visible, followed by the flash of a mermaid's body, showed me my error. Suddenly it came to me. This was the time to tell Mrs. Ames about wanting to marry Margie. Now! Tell her, and tell her to go to Jupiter if she didn't like it. I whirled around and paused aghast. Mrs. Ames was slumped down in a chair, and her eyes were vacuous. Her mouth was wide open, and her fat arms were making wriggling motions as though her hands were flippers and she were trying to swim. She looked like a fish out of water, certainly not like a mermaid. Slowly I turned back to O'Gramey. I grabbed his arm and he looked up, obviously startled. Listen, I said, what did you say an overdose of this breath of Beelzebub would do? His popping green eyes opened wide. Why, darling, he said, how should I know, and how did I get over here? I sort of swayed on my feet and closed my eyes. I was looking down at a bald-headed little man and hearing Slane O'Gramey's voice, but, but, it couldn't be. I opened my eyes and looked across the tank at Margie Ames, my Margie. Her beautiful blue eyes were wide with astonishment, and she was staring down at her own arms and hands in the blankest sort of bewilderment. Then she looked up and caught my eye and said, "'Mr. Deneen, what the devil? Didn't I tell you that six or seven drops would?' I shook my head and closed my eyes again, and something seemed to slip. I didn't open them, but they were open just the same, and all I was seeing was a blur of motion, and I seemed to be going in circles through something wet and blue. I got dizzy and tried to close my eyes again, but they wouldn't close. But I did manage to stop moving, and I shuddered, and the shudder wasn't because the water in the tank was cold. A beautiful young woman, with long flowing hair of gold, swam by. But she didn't have any clothes on, and where her legs should have been there was a tail of a fish. I thought suddenly here was my chance to kiss a mermaid, but she flung some seaweed in my face and ducked into what looked like a cave. I tried to look out of the tank, but everything was distorted and I couldn't make out much. I could hear sounds as though several people were talking at once, but the sounds too were distorted, and I couldn't make out what was being said. I tried to groan, and found I couldn't do that either, and that made me strangely want to giggle, and oddly enough, I was giggling. Then someone was saying, Stop that! and shaking my shoulder, and it didn't seem to be wet and cold anymore. My shoulder was bare, and the hand hurt, and I looked up, 
and suddenly a nursery song of long ago that I'd heard in my childhood came back to me, and I started to sing, I thwam and I thwam right over the... until the shock of hearing my voice come out a rich, throaty contralto made me stop and bring my eyes into focus. And I was looking up at myself, leaning over me, and the other eye was saying in my voice, Listen, I'm Margie Ames, and I'm curious to know who is in my body. I'm Bill, I said. What in the... Bill, she cut in. Where were you? This Mr. O'Gramey, he's over in Senator Weems right now, was explaining what happened, and we took a roll call, and you weren't around. I closed my eyes, or Margie's eyes, again. I should have had it by then, but I was still confused. Coming down the hallway, O'Gramey had told me that four or five drops of the fluid in water would cause partial dissociation of personality. More than that would make it complete, and Mr. Ames had dropped the whole vial into the mermaid tank. It's temporary, Margie said. We change around every few minutes or so, and it'll all come out right when the stuff wears off, but... I was looking down at my temporary shapely arms and bare shoulders, and I started to chuckle. Suddenly, possibly, it was a realization that whatever was happening was temporary. I began to see the humor of the situation. It isn't funny, unexpectedly, to find oneself in the body of a goldfish, but it had been a rare experience, and I'd almost kissed a mermaid. I said, "'This is a beautiful dress we have on, Margie.' She blushed and stamped her big foot on my dainty little open-toed slipper. "'Bill!' she wailed. "'How could you? You, of all people! It isn't decent! It, it's—' And then the funny side of it struck her, too, and we were both laughing like a couple of lunatics. I saw she was waving my arms around in glee. I sobered up a moment and warned, "'Be careful of that watch candid on your—my wrist! It set me back a hundred credits!' I stood up and looked around, and my scope of interest widened as I found myself in the centre of a lot of confusion. Roger Westcott, the interplanetary transport magnet, was chasing his mouse-like wife around the mermaid tank. She ran past me with a frightened look on her face, and I grabbed Westcott's arm. "'Look, Westcott,' I said, "'isn't that a bit?' He grinned at me. "'That's Mrs. Ames, and she's down to the size now where I can give her the spanking I've always wanted.' I jerked and let go of his arm. If anyone wanted to spank Mrs. Ames while the spanking was good, he had my blessing. Then they came around again. I yelled, "'But who are you?' He winked and didn't answer, and that was enough of a tip-off. There are times when a confidential secretary shouldn't even pretend to recognise his boss. I turned back to see if I was still standing beside myself. And I was, so I said, "'Listen, Margie,' my voice interrupted, "'Margie? I thought you were Miss Ames. I'm O'Gramey. I was going to say—' I grabbed myself by the lapels. "'See here, O'Gramey,' I said. "'Are you sure this is all right? I mean, everybody seems to be having lots of fun, but what if we get stuck this way? And listen, can everyone just walk out of range of that stuff? It must affect only a given area.' He grinned my best grin. "'I suggested it, but nobody wants to. Do you?' I hadn't thought about it before, but I didn't. I looked across to where Mrs. Ames was lying on the floor trying to make like a mermaid, and then I glanced at the tank and wondered who was in there, for nine little mermaids were trying to get away from the tenth one. And I began to howl with laughter. No, not for a million credits would I want to walk out on a party like this. Even if it cost me my job, and I was beginning to have a hunch, it would. Then I had an idea. It might be fun to stir the water in the mermaid tank and see what— I started toward it and nearly fell over a chair. The chair hadn't been there before, and I saw I was facing in the opposite direction than the one I'd started out, so I muttered, What the? and looked down and recognised my own suit, my own hands, and my own watch candid on my wrist. I was back home. Just me, or everyone. No— Mr. Ames was still trying to wiggle his way across the floor, and at one end of the divan Mrs. Ames was smoking a big black Venusian cigar. Senator B. Pierpoint Weems, or was it, banged me on the shoulder and said, "'Some fun, huh? 
Nobody knows who's who, so nobody can. He glanced across my shoulder and grinned and started to move past me. I looked back and saw Margie's cute little French maid coming in from the dining room. Her eyes were wide with amazement, and then I saw her face go blank for a moment. So she'd gone under too. I grabbed the senator's arm, or was it the senator, as he tried to pass me and warned, Hey, none of that. What if it's Mrs. Ames? And he shuddered and started the other way. Mr. Ames was starting to get up from the floor. I saw him gazing down at himself with blank bewilderment, and then he looked across at me. "'What is this?' he asked. I grinned and turned to Mr. O'Gramey. I think it was O'Gramey. "'A newcomer in our midst,' I said, jerking a thumb toward Mr. Ames. "'Better explain things to her before she takes her turn in the tank, or is she in for a worse shock?' I didn't want to bother with explanations myself, because I just remembered my watch candid. It could take fifty pictures without reloading, and I had a reload in my pocket if I stayed inside my own coat long enough to use it. It was an Undex B-29, the kind that can photograph the inside of your hat by starlight. Margie came up and touched my arm and said, Bill? I nodded, and she said, This is me. Kiss me quick while we have a chance. It was a proposition I'd never turned down, but I'd admit I looked a bit scared when I put my arms around her and complied. She grinned impishly. Sure, darling. Mother and Dad are probably looking, but so what? For all they know, it's Mr. Westcott kissing the maid, or your slain O'Gramey making love to a mermaid, or the senator. When her lips were free again, she said, Bill, I took some shots on your candid before, when, when I had the chance. Some of them are wows, too. Look, quick, don't miss that. I laughed and swung the candid around to get the shot. When I awoke... It was ten o'clock, but I felt as though I'd had one hour's sleep instead of six. At four o'clock in the morning, I'd left Mr. Ames talking to Slain or Gramey, and when Mr. Ames had said he wanted to talk to me in the morning, I'd already kissed my job goodbye. The first thing I wanted to do was destroy those all-too-candid shots, but I wanted to develop them and have a look-see first. Maybe there'd be one or two mild ones it would be safe to take along as souvenirs, I was taking the last of the positives out of the acid when there was a knock on my door, and I said, Come in. Mr. Ames, wearing a lounging robe, pushed through the door. I made a mental note to look in the mirror later to see if my face looked as bad as his. But surprisingly, he grinned at me and sat down on the edge of the bed. What a night, he sighed. But, but never again, I finished for him. Yeah, I feel the same way. That stuff would have been dynamite to turn loose on the natives. He nodded gloomily. I suppose so. But, well, it was my fault and it's all gone. There isn't a trace left for analysis, and because it was my fault, I gave O'Gramey his price for it. Somehow I like the little cuss. What are you doing? Look, I said, and passed him the quick-drying rack. He stared from one to another of the shots and gulped. Then he stared some more, and his face turned red, then pale. Bill, he said, do you know these photographs would be worth a million credits to my enemies, and those of Westcott and the Senator? I hope you're not thinking of... I shook my head firmly. Just develop them out of curiosity. I'm destroying them right now, and the films too. Then if you say so, I'll leave. I took the pictures back and started to tear them up. Leave? Oh, you think I... He laughed at the gloomy expression on my face. Now that you mention it, Bill, you are leaving. I've had you in mind for the Venusian branch. We need a good man there to get things organised. You're taking over on the first. I had another picture in my hand to tear up, but my heart was making flip-flops. Manager of the Venusian branch? Why, that meant I'd be able to offer Margie a real home. Uh, Mr. Ames, I said, Margie and I are in love. We want to get married. He shrugged, his face suddenly gloomy. Margie's told me that, Bill. But her mother, well, you're not blind. You know how much say so, I... Hey, don't tear those up! The yell was so sudden and unexpected that I jumped and dropped the rack from which I'd been peeling the pictures while we talked. I torn up only a few. <clears throat> 
Fleming Ames picked up the rack, his eyes gleaming. He looked it over eagerly and picked off four pictures. I walked around to see which they were and grinned as I suddenly understood. One was Mrs. Ames, seated with her feet on the coffee table smoking a big black cigar. Another was Mrs. Ames, her hair in wild disarray and her mouth open, trying to swim across the room. The third was Mrs. Ames, but why go into details? Bill, said Mr. Ames, his face happier than I'd seen it ever before. Your wedding day is next Saturday, and that's for a man who knows, from the present and future boss of the Ames household. And you can take my new space cruiser for your honeymoon. He stood up and stuck out his hand, and I shook it. And Bill, he added wistfully, if you should stop on any planetoids, and see any peculiar-looking species of lichen. The End Subscribe for your daily stories of futures past. A new story every single day.